Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Meredith Kahn, and I'll be uh, helping out to moderate our webinar today. Um, welcome to the Library Publishing Coalition uh, webinar series sponsored by the Professional Development Committee. I'm the outgoing chair of the Professional Development Committee, and I'm very happy to have two folks with us today to talk about Manifold, which is the uh, new platform at the University of Minnesota Press. Um, we have two presenters today, um, Susan Dorr and Zach Davis. And Susan and Zach will give an overview of Manifold and um, actually show you a little bit of the, the, the back end of the site. Um, so that should be fairly exciting uh, to see the tool firsthand. Um, Susan and Zach will encourage questions throughout the, the presentation. So please feel free to use the chat box to ask those questions if something comes up. And we'll address those as we go along. We'll also hopefully have some time at the end for Q&A. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenters. So uh, we have Susan Dorr with us. Susan is the Assistant Director for Digital Publishing and Operations at the University of Minnesota Press. And she serves on the board of the Association of American University Presses. Since joining the team at Minnesota in 2005, Susan expanded their scholarly journals program and established systems that increase annual fundraising support. She leads Minnesota's digital publishing initiative. We're also joined by Zach Davis. Zach is the founder of Cast Iron Coding, a web development agency in Portland, Oregon, where he oversees project architecture and development processes. In addition to working on Manifold, Zach has recently been involved in the Commons in a Box initiative, which provides social networking infrastructure for academic institutions, and CUNY's open source VOCAT project, which is a teaching and learning platform. And um, Zach has also worked on a number of, of other commercial web software projects. So I am going to turn it over to Susan and Zach. Uh, Meredith, thank you so much for uh, that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. This is Susan Dorr at the University of Minnesota Press. I want to thank you for having Zach and I here today um, to talk to your group about our project, Manifold Scholarship. Uh, Manifold is a, a two-part project. It is a web platform, and it is also a set of procedures for how to publish within university presses in this new way that we are conceiving. Um, Zach, do you want to flip to the next slide? Sure. Um, so it's a partnership between a university press, a digital humanities center, um, so scholars, and a technology partner, Cast Iron Coding, which uh, to our, our benefit is staffed by people who come out of the humanities. Um, this project is funded with a grant from the Mellon Foundation, and they've made our three-year project possible. Um, go ahead and get to the next slide. Um, we approached Manifold with uh, identifying a few problems. You know, scholarship is, is increasingly digital, and that's not just um, the, the, you know, the output in ebook, but it's also where people are doing their work, where they're collecting their work, and, and scholarship can be more porous um, between works. And with PDF and EPUB formats, right now what they do is they replicate what we do in print. So they don't transform the mode of publication. They simply offer what we already had, but in the digital environment. So what we wanted to do was change and create a, a new publication output um, for the scholarly long form monograph. And we also need solutions that can be uh, scaled. So not only to create one, but to create many. Um, we did do a prototype of Manifold. It's called Debates in the Digital Humanities, and it's a site that we worked with Zach on, and it's hosted at CUNY. But that's one book, and what we needed is something that would scale to many books. Um, at Minnesota, we've done a number of projects over the past years to try to, you know, uh, put ourselves in the digital environment. It began for us with the Quadrant Project, and that was a Mellon-funded initiative that brought scholars to our campus um, to do workshops as they produce their monographs, um, to do work with editors as they were creating the books. And one of the outcomes of that, um, and one of the uh, early ideas for Manifold, was that there were other 
pieces of the project that wouldn't go into the book, but they wanted to share those, publish those. And so Quadrant had a website where they could put up video or they could put up photos. Um, but it, it wasn't integrated into the book. It was a standalone place that you had to go and you could look at some of these other materials. Um, so it wasn't the, the best solution. It was a solution for that time. Then we went into the debates in the Digital Humanities Project, and that also was a partnership with Matt Gold at CUNY and um, Zach here on the call with me. And what we created was an open access website that published the book. And people could interact with the text. They could comment, um, annotate. And, and it was, it's a wonderful site, but it is for one project. It doesn't scale to many projects. Um, the next experiment we did at Minnesota is called Forerunners Ideas First. And what these are are 15,000 to 30,000 word essays. Um, and they are often done, the, and that's the name for the project, before the monograph. So these are works in progress and scholars are writing. Um, they aren't the, ki the same exact kinds of articles you would write for a journal. There's something else. They might come out of blog posts. They might come out of social media conversations. They're really working documents in a scholar's research. Um, the gray literature that doesn't have a formal home with a university press. And so this is our first experiment at trying to um, create a formal publication process and give scholars some feedback, some um, early peer review, as well as the opportunity then when they are published for a dynamic um, project um, where the iterations of it can be published. And that was another early idea that Manifold took up. And I see we have a question, which is, did you always envision Cast Iron as a partner in the project with Minnesota and CUNY? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, because of the prototype for debates in the digital humanities, um, Cast Iron was always, you know, a key partner in this. And Zach, if you want to comment on this, you're welcome to. But um, Zach co-wrote the grant proposal with Matt Gold and myself, um, and so we've always been collaborating since the beginning of this project. Zach, do you want to comment on that? No, I, I don't really have anything to add. Although, yeah. um, I, I, well, maybe I do. I, I think it was. I think that was a really important collaboration because part of what I think made that grant proposal so strong was that there were these three different voices. I mean, you had the publisher voice, Matt had the academic voice, and then I was able to come in and and speak in a in a, in a real way to technically how it was going to be built and how it might function. And I think that made the proposal stronger. Yeah, I also think it shaped some of the questions that we decided to ask and attempt to answer um, to mm -hmm. have your perspective. You know, I remember in some of those collaborations, there would be ideas proposed by one of the three of us, and then one of the other of us would say, well, this is why that might be the, the wrong path at this right. point, or, you know. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, it helped focus the project. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so then just getting back to the last bullet on this slide, Manifold Scholarship. So that is the next iteration of our digital development here at the University of Minnesota Press. And um, we're building uh, a publication platform that will work with both interactive and what we're calling iterative um, dynamic books. Uh, Zach, do you want to go to the next slide? Yep. So this gets to debates in the digital humanities. Um, this is a hybrid project. It is completely open access on the web, but it is simultaneously a for sale print book and a for sale ebook. And of course, the print and the ebook are those static forms. Um, and it's the open access edition with the interaction of scholars and readers on the site that is dynamic. Um, we have since turned this into an annual series, so every year we'll be producing a new edition of Debates in the Digital Humanities. Um, and we are going to continue with that hybrid approach. So far, um, we're finding that open access has not impacted sales. In fact, we might even be able to speculate that it's been successful in part because of the discovery. Um, the print sales have definitely met and even exceeded our expectations. Um, Matt Gold runs an open peer review process, and then the press peer reviews the volume as a whole. So Matt peer reviews the articles, and we peer review the volume. Um, and their social reading and highlighting, commenting, annotation, 
and we wanted to carry that into um, Manifold, and we are carrying that into Manifold. It's got hyperlinks, um, and it's open source code. And then the three of us partnered on that, and we continue with Manifold. Um, so the objectives of the project here, uh, we had to take a look at different points of view because there's three partners here, and we all have different things that we need out of it. So we want to rethink how the author works for iterative publication. What do they need to be doing to prepare their work so that they can both publish iteratively, so at, um, elements as they go, and this gets into things like collecting permissions as they go for you know, different pieces they want to publish on the web, um, getting used to writing in discrete chapters that could be published one at a time, um, and, you know, some of those considerations. We also need to be efficient as a publisher. Um, one of the things that a press brings to publication is that we have really efficient process, or we can have really efficient process. It's certainly scalable. Um, but if we are publishing books in pieces, if we are publishing uh, bits here and then bits here a little bit later, we, we lose some efficiency. So how can we create a set of procedures that still works while we have our traditional, you know, projects and as well as these iterative projects that we're doing on Manifold. Um, we want to incorporate all of the different kinds of media that authors want to bring into their books. And you know, it's traditionally been the path of an editor to help uh, weed out different elements um, that can't fit in a printed monograph or even an ebook monograph. And Manifold is capable of including a lot more resources. Um, so some of the things that authors need to do for that, one is um, if we're publishing these to the web, there's the element of uh, what sort of descriptions do they need to be web for accessibility in the web. Um, there's also collecting the captions and the permissions and really creating a process just for those digital materials that may appear within the book but also may not. They may just be discrete resources on the project page. Um, we want Manifold to have interactivity so that you can comment and you can have discussions around the text and within the text um, so that you can annotate, so that you can link out in social media, um, perhaps bring social media into the book, but also push it, the book out into social media. And really this is a publishing platform. This is the place where we make it public. Authors are not writing in Manifold. Instead, they're doing their writing, working with their editor, and then publishing to Manifold. Um, and so then you can see some of the early design here for Manifold. It's really a platform that is it's built for authors and publishers, but it's built to publish books, not to, not to be an authoring tool to write books. One of the very early questions we receive from other publishers is how is Manifold different than Scalar? And that, I think, is the key right there. It isn't a place where you're doing your writing. You do that somewhere else, and we publish it onto the Manifold site. Um, and then the next slide. So what I think is the key to Manifold are the last three words of this statement. We want publications to be living digital works. We want them to be dynamic. We really want them to change and integrate with um, the web environment. So it is an intuitive, collaborative platform, and, um, and it has iterative aspects to monograph publications. So it isn't one fixed version that exists forever as it is. Instead, these things can change. They can be added to, and they can incorporate um, comments and media and really become ongoing living books. So Zach, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Susan. Yeah. Uh, so, um, for the for for my part of this talk, I'm gonna kind of walk you through some early design comps of Manifold, and then we'll we'll maybe spend some time uh, looking at Manifold um, live and in the proverbial flesh in my development environment um, and see what it does. Um, so, uh, you know, first first thing to note is that. HTML is the lingua franca of Manifold. So uh, in theory, and Manifold is very much a work in, in progress, so, so when, when you hear me preface something with, with in theory, it just means we haven't you know, maybe built it all the way out yet. But in theory, um, anything that can 
become HTML can be consumed and rendered by Manifold. Um, so our starting point uh, in terms of the source files for Manifold are, are EPUBs. And EPUBs are, as you probably know, essentially a collection of um, HTML documents according to a spec. Um, what you see here in this slide is um, you know, a chapter from an EPUB that has been uh, broken down into its constituent parts so that we have a kind of node uh, or a hierarchical node tree uh, of the, the contents of, of that EPUB or of that, of that section. Um, there's a lot of you know, different technologies powering Manifold. Um, and, and I'll kind of run through these quickly. If anyone has questions, you know, please post a message in chat or jump in. That's fine. Um, there's two pieces, two kind of main components to Manifold. One is the server-side piece, and the other is the client-side application. Um, the server-side piece is written in Rails, uh, in Ruby. Um, it, at its heart, it does a lot of kind of HTML and XML parsing, and it uses Nokogiri for that. And it exposes all of its data um, in, via a REST API in the form of JSON. Um, that's a really kind of key point, I think, to make about Manifold. Um, the, the user experience, the client-side application, is completely separate from the server, which means that uh, when a book or a resource or a text goes into Manifold, that data is exposed over APIs. And we hope that in some future point, a community of users might develop other uses for Manifold or you know, potentially vis visualizations of some of the, the contents that are in a Manifold installation. Um, and we try to make that possible via the APIs. Um, the client is a single page application um, built with React. Um, so it's, it's mainly JavaScript. Um, we do take uh, you know, various accessibility issues into consideration. So Manifold um, will work fine even in a browser that doesn't have JavaScript enabled and the contents of a, of a Manifold text will be um, crawlable and indexable and searchable. Um, the, you know, Manifold is open source. The current state of the code is on GitHub right now. Um, you know, eventually we will get to a place where we provide detailed installation instructions so uh, institutions, individuals, publishers um, can download their own copy of Manifold and, and run it in their own environment. Um, let's see. So um, one kind of thing we're thinking of or a phrase we toss around a lot when we think about Manifold is this idea of the Manifold edition, um, which I think is in contrast to the print edition. Um, you know, unlike the print edition, which is relatively static and fixed, the Manifold edition is iterative and networked. Um, on the network side, uh, we want to be able to include a variety of kinds of rich media uh, alongside or as part of the Manifold edition. Um, and those could be video or documents, they could be images, they could be transcripts of interviews or audio files. Um, we want to support as wide a range of media as possible. Um, we, it also includes um, you know, the conversations that happen around a text. So you know, a, a use of Manifold we talk about sometimes is um, what if there's a, a class where a manifold edition is being used as a, as a text in the class? Can the students in the class go onto the manifold site, engage in a discussion about the text, and highlight and annotate the text and see one another's comments? I mean, that's, that's a use case we'd like to support. Um, can we pull in tweets about, it, about a specific project um, into manifold? Um, that's something we want to be able to do. Um, and then on the iterative side, we want manifold to be able to show not just that finished text, but all the work, or some of the work at least, that leads up to it. So the main unit in, a, in Manifold is not a book or an EPUB, but it's the project. And the project is composed of text. And one of those could be the print edition in the form of an EPUB, but one could be an early draft of a chapter or um, the author's notes or a book proposal. It could be any number of documents. And we Manifold isn't prescriptive in terms of what those uh, texts are and how they're structured. Um, oops. Here we're looking at um, 
the a kind of a screenshot from a, a early comp of the project view for Manifold. So you can see um, there's a couple categories, drafts and research, and then there's a couple different texts within it. So again, there's that the top level is the project and in that have text, there are a number of texts and those are kind of grouped together by categories. Um, and these categories can be set on a project by project basis. Um, resources, uh, the, the media files that I referred to, um, these can be embedded within a text, which we'll see in a second, or they can be just live at the project level. Um, so, you know, this could be a way where uh, some of the kind of primary material or the, the primary sources or the research material could be collected as part of the project, but not necessarily put into a text. Or this could be used um, for an author or the publisher to, to augment the print edition with additional media that for whatever reason couldn't be included in the print version, maybe because it's video, um, maybe because there's too much of it, um, you know, image gallery, for example. Um, th this part's a little tricky, of course, because EPUBs um, and especially EPUB 3 can contain rich media already. I mean, you can have a video in an EPUB file and if the EPUB reader um, supports it, then uh, it'll play. Um, so we want to make sure that we, and we do, you'll see in a second how we do this, we differentiate between what's part of the text and what is uh, augmenting the text or augmenting the manifold edition. Um, there's a question in chat that says, can the primary object be multimedia opposed to text? So the, the primary object is the project and the, the, which could be composed of resources, I suppose, solely and have no text, um, although I don't think that would be the normal case. And then at kind of the same level within the project are the resources and the text. Um, so they're, they're kind of split out and treated a little bit differently. Um, when you arrive at Manifold, um, you see something that looks a bit like this. Uh, it shows um, some of the current projects in the system um, and you know, the user can kind of filter or sort them. Um, you'll notice that there's a couple different kinds in here. So we, we have, you know, Trust, for example, which is a, a, a book that's been published. It has a cover. Um, it has an, a physical artifact. And, and we don't want to conceal that. Manifold, we want Manifold to make it clear that that is, in fact, a book. But next to it, we have Japanese documentary film. And this is the state we give a project when it's still in an early or provisional um, phase. Uh, and so we want these things to live next to each other. And, and I don't know, Susan, if you want to say anything here, but there's certainly been a lot of discussion internally around, you know, like how do we have, how do we show projects in their different states of being without necessarily prioritizing um, the finished pro project or finished product over the, the in progress one? Yeah, we were really concerned. I see there's a question. We'll come back to that in a minute. We're really concerned with, um, giving projects that are before formal you know, publication of the book uh, as much uh, primacy, I guess, as the finished published project, because we want you to follow along with the manifold work as it's evolving. Um, so one of the ways we get at that is on this screen, maybe you can read it, it says published June 2016, for instance. Um, what that really is meant to be is an update of when the last material was added to the project. So we're trying to give some sense of how frequently things are or when things are updated. And these icons um, that look a little bit like manuscripts right now um, are early you know, earlier projects than the books that are formally published and have their finished cover. Um, it's, I think that that's still an, perhaps an in-progress thing, although maybe it's, it's coming to a close, that discussion. There's, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, we have a question um, from the, where do the media files, the resource files live, and how are the mm -hmm. links preserved and sustained? So the, you know, the, the, I think the workflow we've been envisioning is that um, and again, to Susan's point, that Manifold isn't an authoring tool. Um, the publisher, the press, will upload media to a project. They'll add resources to a project. And in doing so, those files will be stored on the server that's running Manifold or potentially um, it could be in a cloud you know, object storage 
platform like S3, depending on how it's configured. Um, how they're preserved and sustained is to, I think, large degree up to the press. Um, now for external resources that aren't going to be hosted by the press, um, those would be included a little bit differently as, a, as an external link that may, and the user would link out to it. Um, we had some discussions earlier about trying to have Manifold um, do some work around you know, checking those, those external links and making sure that they, they persist and are still around and then uh, notifying the press if they go away. Um, you know, that's kind of on a feature wish list. We'll see if that gets developed or not. And I, I should make clear that we don't see Manifold as an archive. Um, we, we see archive purposes and preservation, uh, you know, as something separate from publication of, manif of a project on Manifold. Um, some of our first projects are projects coming out of archives. So they will have collections of materials and resources that are housed at those archives, and that's where the preservation is happening of the of the real materials. Um, that, but they're folded into the project here on Manifold, you know, as part of the scholarly work. Um, we are looking at DOIs and how to use them um, on the materials that we have, so that we can get at least the stable URL um, to to have the links to the materials. But that, but we don't see our role as a preservation or archive tool. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an example of uh, what the kind of a, the, the project page or the top of it looks like for a pretty completed project. I mean, this is a book that is um, has been published. It you can read it in Manifold, and it has a print edition. Um, and and when there is a kind of final print edition, we give it a little bit of pride of place, and the user can kind of just start reading it without looking down at the text on the project. Um, and we'll also, you know, offer an opportunity to buy it or a way to jump into the table of contents. Um, so, but reading is only one part of Manifold. Um, you know, we also want users to be able to interact with text and leave their own mark on what they're reading. Um, and so here we see, um, you know, part of what an EPUB in Manifold will look like. Um, you know, at the top, we have a resource that is embedded within the text, and that resource can be annotated, and there can be discussion taking place around it. Whoops, darn it. Sorry, moved my mouse the wrong way. Uh, Okay. Um, down below, we have the annotation. So users will be able to um, select an arbitrary passage from the text. Um, when they do that, they'll see a pop-up box that gives them an interface where they can um, start writing about that passage. And then Manifold will collect their annotations across multiple um, texts. Uh, so they can use it as a way to pull out passages or to store their responses to a text. We, we did something similar on the um, debates in the digital humanities site, um, and it was pretty well received, I think. Um, there's some limitations to how we did it there, which is why I think of it as a proof of concept. I think we'll go quite a bit farther uh, in Manifold. Um, Manifold will also show the, the activity or the history around a project. So, you know, when a new text is added, um, that will be noted. Uh, when uh, somebody tweets using a project-specific hashtag, um, or if the author tweets, um, Manifold will try to pick that up and include it in the activity stream. Um, when you know annotations by the author are added, uh, we would want to show that as well, potentially. Um, and then, of course, Manifold is going to be um, responsive and you know fully functional on a variety of devices, um, just like almost everything that we're building these days is. Um, so let me um, kind of pull back for a second and just like show it to you a little bit. I'm going to share my, um, my browser here. While Zach sets up, um, are there any questions? Uh, so, the question is, if Manifold is not an authoring tool like Scalar, who is responsible for keeping the projects updated, press staff? 
the answer is that press staff will be responsible for putting the materials onto Manifold. It's up to the author to continue writing the project and working with their editor to have something to publish to Manifold, but the production editor for the press will be the person who actually posts the stuff onto the site and interacts on that back end um, of the Manifold site. Okay. Uh, can you all see my screen okay? Susan, can you see my yep. screen? Yep. Okay. I can see it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and log in, which isn't necessary to use it, but kind of nice. Um, all right, so now I am at the screen of Manifold. Once, that, once I'm uh, logged in, I can choose to follow or unfollow certain projects. And um, if I follow a project, it'll show up on this following page. And I'll also um, potentially have notifications about things that are happening on the project sent to me. Uh, if that's how I've configured my account. Um, let's go ahead and look at this first book here. Um, so this is not something we would necessarily think of as a manifold project. This was just in one of the um, handful of EPUBs that Susan or somebody gave me that we've been loading into manifold to see how it does with those EPUB files. Um, you can see at the top, we kind of right now have a very rudimentary view of the project. Um, none of the, the artwork behind it that we saw in the comps. Um, but that's coming. And we just have one text on the project and no resources. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start reading it. Um, and this takes me into the reader view where I can see the text. Um, and, you know, any uh, assets from the EPUB will be pulled in and captioned accordingly um, and stored along with it. We have some kind of you know, straightforward controls for the reader. If they like it a little bit larger, they can change it. Or if they like it sans serif instead of serif, background, margin. Um, we want to make a really clean and pleasant reading experience for the readers. Um, right now, you know, when we import an EPUB file into Manifold, um, we're doing it through the command line because we haven't yet gotten to the point in the project where we've built out the backend interfaces that make it possible to, to, for a non-technical person to pull it in. Um, but I'll kind of show you, I think, um, like what this looks like. Um, I'll look at the acknowledgement page here, and I, and I happen to have this um, book open in Oxygen XML Editor, which is just a simple tool for looking at and editing an EPUB file. Um, so we'll make a little change to this EPUB file. Academy. Okay. And then I'm going to jump over to my um, command line. And like I said, eventually there'll be a graphic interface for this. And I'm just going to ingest the EPUB file again. So, you know, things change in EPUB files and Manifold needs to be able to re-ingest it. Um, uh, and once we have annotations and resources in place, it needs to be able to track the locations of those uh, attached pieces of content to the new version of the text. So that's done. It takes Manifold, you know, maybe five or ten seconds to uh, consume one EPUB file. Um, if I go to the front end and reload, I can see that it's updated the text from the EPUB file with my new change that I made to it. Um, it's kind of interesting to see what this, I think, what this same page looks like from the API side. So um, this is calling Manifold's API where it exposes all of its content. I've given it the uh, unique identifier for this particular chapter in the text, which Manifold generated. Um, and you'll see here, and it, I don't know, some of you may have looked at Jason before and some of you may have not. Um, if you haven't, bear with me but um, the text is completely broken out. Um, so it's not hard to envision you know, a different system that crawled through and grabbed all the text nodes or did some analysis of this, this structure. Um, we do that for every text in Manifold. Um, the projects themselves are also exposed over this API. So here's a different call to get all of the projects in this installation. Um, and you know, it provides like some basic information about each of these, and, and over time it will provide uh, more and additional metadata. Um, are there any 
questions? Uh, any, anyone want to jump in and ask anything here? Um, I'm happy to go more in depth on any of the technology, um, but that's about where we're at in terms of Manifold and what I was going to show for today. So the question is, will users be able to download the EPUB file to read on their eBooks? And at this point, um, we're envisioning a hybrid environment where the open access free edition will be on Manifold site, and the EPUB file will be a, a paid object um, that you can purchase. Now, this Manifold itself, if it were used by other publishers, you could make it free to download those EPUBs. That's just not our business model. Um, and frankly, you could put Manifold behind a paywall, too, if a publisher were so inclined. That also is not the approach we're taking with this project. Um, I can field the next question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's, it's so great to see Reclaim Hosting here because Jim Groom, the, the co-founder of Reclaim Hosting, is a, a longtime friend of mine. Um, I, I would like nothing more than to work with um, Tim and Jim on getting Manifold in a one-click install on Reclaim. Um, you know, the support model for the software going forward, um, you know, that's a, that's a trickier question. Um, we hope that, you know, by the, and I, it's not just a hope, by the time we get to the end of this grant, Manifold will be fully functional and feature complete. Um, I believe that UMN and or CUNY has a small amount of money budgeted for ongoing maintenance and support. Um, and then I have, you know, Cast Iron Coding and me personally has deep interest in this project and its continued success. Um, what I would like to see more than anything is a community develop around Manifold of users and developers and, and try to make it a, a self-sustaining open source project so that we don't need a lot of funding for it to continue. Um, uh, so then there's a question about seeding the open peer reviewer annotation functions with when they launch. Um, the open peer review has only been for the debates in the Digital Humanities Project. So it's, it's not going to be used formally on these other Manifold projects. Um, as a part of Manifold, I suppose we could run it that way if we were trying that, but we haven't, as a press, planned to experiment with that. It's something Matt's doing at CUNY. Um, in terms of the annotation functions with Daylatch, I'm not quite sure when you say seed, uh, what exactly you mean I by that. Maybe have you know? some, some uh, like sample content in place or, or have some, some discussion. I mean, one thing we talked about is, yeah, or yeah. at least Matt and I talked about was potentially having authors um, do some annotations. And I didn't, I don't have the comp at hand that shows this, but um, you know, when a user goes into a text, they will be able to show only the author's annotations, and that could be an interesting way to, to get some annotative content in place beforehand. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had a lot of um, annotation and interaction on the debate site, so I think we've been um, presuming, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, that we'll see some similar activity with Manifold. There's been a lot of excitement among scholars. Um, since we announced the project, we've had more than 30 projects proposed, you know, to potentially flow through Manifold. So we know that there's interest. Yeah. We should also, um, while well, I wait for another question to come in, just re refer people to manifold.umn.enu or .edu. This is a kind of blog we've been keeping. We don't post very often, but we post periodically about um, the process of building Manifold. And there's you know, some good good stuff in here around the technical details, you know, what kind of works we think are make good for good manifold candidates, um, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, there was a comment about whether there's vetting of the comments. Zach, I can't I don't recall that we decided to withhold comments before they're published. We are okay. not. We're we're we flagging. Not. So there there's right. there'll be a mechanism where a con comment can be flagged and then raised to the attention of an administrator. Yeah. Um, and there's a question for you. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple here. Um, there's one up above. Will there be any ability to customize the design of a project? Um, the design will be customizable in terms of um, like what, what images you show. Um, you know, we do want, we want another press to, 
to be uh, able to t use Manifold and have their own branding and their own colors on it. So there will be some kind of global templating ability in Manifold. Um, as far as like really changing the look and feel of a project on a project by project basis, that's not currently planned, um, but if there is demand for it, we might rethink that. Um, Kevin Hawkins has a question. So EPUB is the input format for Manifold, but EPUB like HTML can vary quite a bit in structure internally. How brittle is the import process? Um, <laughs> so time, time will tell on that one, but I, I think my tentative answer is not that brittle. Um, and the reason for that is because we're going kind of from HTML to HTML. And the way we, we, we do this is um, how do I put this simply? We, we have a, a kind of like, as part of our ingestion process, we have a, a parsing and validation component. So we take the HTML from each part of the, of the EPUB and we turn it into a hierarchical JSON tree. And then we put that back together on the client side using React. Now along the way, there are, um, a number of rules around like what CSS will allow through and what we won't allow through. Um, and you know, if you've worked with Ruby before, and maybe you've worked with Nokogiri, like this project would not be possible without the very robust abilities of Nokogiri, our HTML parser that we have at the heart of it. Um, so I think we've hit a really nice middle ground between like not changing the EPUB too much and and letting too much through, but there's going to be fine tuning there over over time. Um, currently, like I said, it supports EPUB 2 and EPUB 3. Um, the next thing we want to do is also support Word documents because, you know, like if an author has a draft of a chapter that we want to get into Manifold, um, it's not going to come to us as an EPUB and it's too burdensome to ask the, the press to, you know, prepare an EPUB for everything. So we want to be able to take a Word, a, a Word document or maybe a PDF and get that into HTML and get it into Manifold. I'm more worried about that process in some ways than I am about the EPUB. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's a question from uh, Lisa Schiff about how are we managing and handling usage statistics. Uh, if I recall, it's right, right now our press uses uh, Google Analytics for our own website, and Zach, were we did we integrate that, or was the plan? We, to we will, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I see like web analytics as outside of the domain of Manifold, and therefore not something we would want to invest resources in. That said, we will have Manifold will have a kind of backend interface, and we've done wireframing, I believe, for an, a kind of author interface too, where they can see some very high level analytics, like how many annotations are there for this book or how many people read it in the last week. So Manifold might keep track of some of that, but, but that's about it. Yeah. Are there any other questions? When will it go live? <laughs> well, um, we are looking at going live with a beta, I would say later this summer or fall. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, we have our first couple of book projects um, in production here at the press. And um, so we have material to post to it once we're ready to put the site up in a beta version. Um, and I think we were looking at, I want to say like September, but I, know, I don't know if we've got an exact date yet. In fact, I know we don't have an exact date yet. Um, so we're looking at late summer, fall as our public beta. Um, I'm, I just want to also refer people here, especially those of you who are more technically minded, um, you know, please take a look at the GitHub repo. Um, we have some, you know, like documentation that probably could use updating, but, you know, it, 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 I think it's an easy project to kind of jump into and look at. Um, we keep very careful and detailed commit history on this. Um, so, you know, please take a look, contribute. If you want to try to um, get install it yourself at some point, um, we'd love it and would be happy to talk to people about it. All right. 
Well, if we don't have any more questions, I think that's the end of what Zach and I have to share with you today. I would love to encourage you all to reach out to us by email. Um, we would be more than happy to answer more questions. We've been going to some conferences and talking about Manifold, and um, as it develops, we're happy to continue sharing um, what we're doing, and, um, and we'd love to hear from you about what you think. Thank you, Zach and Susan. Um, this was really great. Uh, for everyone in attendance, we, we were recording this, and the recording will be made available later if you'd like to share it with your colleagues. Um, thanks again on behalf of the Library Publishing Coalition and the Pro Professional Development Committee of, of the LPC, and we look forward to seeing you again at future webinars. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.